Well, I want to welcome all of our campuses that are joining us live right now. We're so excited to have every one of you, and particularly every week, I want to welcome the men and women at the Orleans Justice Center and the St. Tammany Parish Jail. Come on, can we just welcome those with us right now? Happy Resurrection Day. What a powerful demonstration. What a powerful testimony of how Christ came and changed Darren's life, where God's hand came upon his life. And how many you know when God's hand comes upon your life, you're, you're never the same? You're never the same. Interestingly enough, I, I was thinking about the concept of a hand. Now think about this for a moment. I, I was thinking about Darren's hand. And it was interesting when, when Donald, who's one of our pastors, who's his brother-in-law, and that was his hand that he put upon Darren's hand. There's something about the assurance that comes from a hand. Just think about how many things that you and I do with our hands. We communicate with our hands. We, we, we uh, uh, correct things with our hands. We affirm things with our hands. Matter of fact, I was uh, yesterday, I wear a tie two times a year on the weekend. Now, if I do a funeral or weddings different times, but so on Easter, Resurrection Weekend, I wear a tie and also Christmas Eve. Do y'all like this? This looks like I won this at a Mary Kay convention. Do y'all like this? <laughs> this, is, this is the limit, man. I push it on this when I sales consultant for Mary there. I was, I was tightening my tie yesterday, you know, and, I, and I, I just thought to myself, I thought, man, you know, how many things we actually do with our hands? I want you to think about that just for a moment. How many things do we actually do with our hands? I never forget the time my wife told me, she goes, Steve, I'll be honest, you know, we had been married for a little while and I, I was a, a preacher, uh, an evangelist at the time. She goes, Steve, I, I gotta be honest, man. If you, if anything like happens to your voice, we're in trouble because you don't really can, you don't do a lot with your hands. How many of y'all praying for pastor's voice? Come on now. Keep pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. It's amazing how many things we actually do with our hands. I wrote this down. Hands are full of symbolism and power. There's sensitivity with our hands. We, with our hands, we affirm. With our hands, we build. With our hands, we connect. How many of y'all remember the time when you were uh, dating, whether it's your, your spouse or maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and, 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 and you get to that moment, you make that decision, you think to yourself, it's kind of, it's kind of spontaneous, but it's kind of calculative all at the same time. You've been out a couple times, you think, man, this is the moment, and you're just kind of, you're kind of feeling it. Come on, you know what I'm talking about, and, and you kind of reach over, and there's a risk, there's a vulnerability attached to this movement. And you just kind of go for it, and you, and you reach out for their hand, and it's like, ah! and then they grab yours, and it's like, it's on now. <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's a connection, man. So that hand is communicating, it's communicating relationship. Think about the power, the power of a hand. We do a thing uh, around here where where people turn 13. It's kind of an interesting thing. We learned it a number of years ago from, from this guy that came and spoke to our men and uh, Robert Lewis. He talked about having manhood ceremonies. So kind of like the Jewish bar mitzvah where you turn 13 and there's a celebration. And so I've been to a bunch of them. I've had them with my kids. And I'll never forget a number of years ago, I was with my friend Jeff Little. Now he's a big man, but his dad is huge. His dad's like 6'8". And I'll never forget, we were in Dallas and at this manhood ceremony and Jeff's nephew, which would have been his dad's uh, grandson, uh, he, he, he went to go lay hands and pray for him. And I, I leaned I said, Jeff, your dad's hand is huge. It was, I'm serious, it must have been like 10 to 11, maybe 13 inches. I mean, it was just like he was coming down and I, there was such power. And I said, Jeff, this, this hand is huge, man. He goes, I know, I know, trust me. And he turned around and looked behind him. As a kid, he remembered. But anyway... I know we don't do that anymore, but that was back in the 70s. But nonetheless, it was interesting when I began to think out about how big his hand was, I began to think about the concept of God's hand. Do, do you know how many times the Bible talks about the hand of the Lord? Can y'all say it with me? Say it. One, two, three, the hand of the Lord. That's a biblical concept, the hand of the Lord. 
Watch this in Acts chapter 11. This is very powerful. The Bible says in Acts 11, it says, and the, I want you to say at the count of three, one, two, three, the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Pastor, what does it mean? What does it mean? Watch this. What does it mean, the hand of the Lord? You see that in the Bible. It's kind of like the day that you go shopping for a car and you kind of know what car you want, you drive to the dealership and you see that car everywhere. The same way, now that I've introduced this thought to you, the hand of the Lord, it's all over the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. The hand, what is the hand of the Lord? Let me give you a little, just a little snapshot. It's the, it's the presence of God. It's the touch of God. It's the guiding influence of God in your life. It's the hand of the Lord. I have four children. I remember when I taught each one of them uh, how to ride a bike, and, and there's that moment where, of course, you put the training wheels on them, and it's, it's you know, that's, that's kind of the easy phase. You know, All right, look, I'm going to push you. You've got training wheels. Don't worry about it. Just, just, just keep rolling. So you just kind of push them, and, the, and, the, and then they're going. But then there comes that day, that day when you take those training wheels off. It's risky. And so you got your kids, you're like, all right, look, I, I'm going to, dad's going to be with you. Mom's going to be with you, right? And so you put your hands on them and you're, and you're running with them. Of course, you're praying that they don't stop. You flip over, you look stupid in front of your neighbor's bed. And so you're just kind of running and praying and, and your hands are guiding them. I began to think about with God, how often in our lives we think that we're on our own. We think that we're pulling off life. And if we only could see in the spiritual realm, it's the hand of the Lord guiding us and leading us and keeping us. I want to talk to you on this resurrection weekend. I want to talk to you about three things related to the hand of the Lord. I want to answer three different questions. Number one, number one, I want to answer this question. Why did God create us by his hands? Why did God create us by his hands? God created the universe. If you look in Genesis chapter one, very interesting. Genesis chapter one is, is, is an account of the creation of God. Genesis chapter 2, in a sense, is, is filling somewhat of the details. It's, it, it goes a little bit deeper. It's extensive. And what stru struck me the other day when I was reading this, it's fascinating. Genesis chapter 1, God spoke. God said. God spoke. Watch this. God spoke, and, and, he, and he created the stars, and, and he created the moon. It was amazing. God, God created the galaxies, and God created the earth by his voice. God spoke, and God spoke, and God spoke. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, interestingly enough, the Bible says that God, that God created man as he reached down and grabbed the dust of the earth. So in other words, God created the universe with his mouth, but God created you and I with his hands. Isaiah 45 says it this way. It says, I've made the earth and created man on it and with my, everybody say it, hands. There's something about God's hands. Why is it so important to understand God's hands? Because God's hands, when he created you and I, he created us unique, different, and intentional. Every single one of us. There's nobody like anybody else related to the complexities of their personality and their aptitudes and their strengths and their weaknesses we're all different. I remember as a kid, of course, I had long blonde hair, straight, straight, straight hair as a kid. Of course, as a boy, I didn't like my straight hair. I wanted curly hair. And all those of you that had curly hair, you didn't like your hair. You wanted what? Straight hair. And why is that? We always want what we don't have until we understand and celebrate the fact that God created us unique. How often do we despise the parts of who we are? Isn't it interesting how human beings do? We all do this, myself included. We often compare our weaknesses with somebody else's strength. Or we compare our strengths with somebody else's weaknesses. If we only understood that God has created each one of us unique, you are different, I am different. And the Bible says God created us by his hands. The question is why? Why did God create us? This is such a deep theological question. I don't have time to expound on all that. But I will say this. I believe the reason why God created us is because God had a desire. Listen to what I'm about to say. 
He had the plants. He had creation. He had the animals. But he created someone in his likeness because he wanted to share his life with them and his love with them. Isn't it interesting that God created us in his likeness where he could communicate with us? So in other words, God is filled with his life and his love. Matter of fact, God is love. First John 4, 8, the essence of God don't miss this. The essence of God is love, but love is not a concept. Love is an expression. In other words, you've got to demonstrate, I love you. Well, you don't show me. I don't see it. Love is a commitment. Love is a covenant. And God created you and I, and God created mankind because God wanted to demonstrate his love. God wanted to demonstrate. In other words, he, he, he wanted to love us by his actions. You know what's so cool about God? You guys, you know, this is so cool about God loves us in our good days and he loves us on our bad days. God loves us when we're up and he loves us when we're down. A number of years ago, I was gonna do a series and we started working on the artwork and it was gonna be called, here's what it was gonna be called. You guys ready? The God of the Second Chance. And I thought to myself, I don't like that title because I'm sure glad God's given me three and four chances at times. And five, how many of y'all grateful that God didn't wipe you out after the second chance? Come on. I'm grateful. I am so grateful. And what's so cool about the love of God is that God's love is unconditional. All right, here's culture's love. You ready? I will love you if... I will love you when... Here's God's love. You ready? I'll love you in spite... I love you regardless. Man, isn't that powerful? Matter of fact, I'd venture to say that God not only loves us, but he likes us. This is going to sound cheesy and corny. If God had a refrigerator, he'd probably have your picture on it. <laughs> I know it's graduation time. You know, everybody's got pictures on everybody's fridge. You know what I'm saying? Christmas or graduation. If God had a wallet, he'd have your picture in it. Why? Because God likes you. That's what happened to Darren. What happened to Darren is Darren finally realized that, that he was this you know, brilliant, intellectual British guy, and he finally realized that life cannot be reduced down to, to rational formulas, but there's a God that created him that loves him. Number one, why did God create us? He created us to love us. Number two, I want to answer the second question, and that is why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to die? Steve, I, 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 I got to be honest, Steve. I like, I like the moral teachings of Jesus. I mean, I like the fact that, that Jesus has good teaching. And I like the fact, I mean, after all, who doesn't like that, right? Do unto others as you would have them do. I mean, that's good stuff, right? If we all really lived that, we'd have a better society. I mean, think about it. Think about, you know, the least of these and the poor. and how, I mean, who, who would not like that? And, and Steve, after all, I like the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I like how Jesus loved and enfranchised those that felt like they were on the edges of society and, and, and the leper and the prostitute. I mean, how he cleansed and he, and he healed and he, and he gave chances and, and he fed. I mean, I like all of that socially, religiously, theologically. I like that, Steve, but I have a question. Do we have to do the blood part? I mean, Christianity, come on. It's kind of, it's, it's got that gory dimension of the suffering and the blood. In other words, in other words, can we, can we sanitize Christianity just a little bit? Because if we did, it, it seems as though it would be somewhat a little bit more palatable to our culture because it's just, it seems to be gory and, and the cross and, 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 and do we, in other words, do we really, can we take the teachings of Christ without the death of Christ? I'll never forget a number of years ago. Oh man, this was in the early nineties. I was in college and I, I heard this speaker and, and, and I remember he was a psychologist and he was from Maryland. I, I can't remember his name, but I remember the psychologist, and I remember him saying the statement. And here's what he said. Don't forget this. 
He said the most powerful human emotion that motivates us, albeit good or bad, watch this. He says this is the emotion of guilt. And he says what a human being does with guilt will largely determine the outcome of their life. And he talked about how, how, how human behavior so often it revolves around what do you do with your guilt? And it's interesting, the lengths that we go to to deal with our guilt. We can deny our guilt. We can push it aside. We can, we can, we can say guilt doesn't exist. We can, we can stuff our guilt. We can try to vacation our guilt away. We can try to accomplish our guilt away. We can do a whole number of things. Of course, we can say, well, the reason why, and this is where there's sections of our culture today that would say, well, the reason why people feel guilty is because of this archaic book, the Bible. We can just get away from the Bible because in the Bible, they've got passages that make me feel guilty. So, so let's just get rid of that. If we can get rid of the Bible, the problem is you can get rid of the Bible, but you can, you can run from the Bible, but you can't run from your conscience. You're a moral being and you know intuitively there's a right and there's a wrong. That's what differentiates you between an animal. You, you are made in the image of God. So in other words, you and I have been made in the likeness of God, which is to suggest that we have a moral conscience inside of us. And when we violate that, there's a trigger that says, mm, something is wrong. Something is wrong. I've done something. Wrong. What do you do with that? Do you repress it? Do you deny it or do you bring it somewhere? What do you do with your guilt? It's interesting, when God created Adam and Eve, he, he placed them in a garden. And he said, you can do whatever you want, go wherever you want. You can eat from any tree. There's just one, just one, just one. Ah, God's up in heaven. He's trying to take fun away. Really? You can do anything you want, go wherever you want, Adam and Eve. Just don't eat from one tree. That's it, just one. The Bible says that they ate, and when they did that, they, they were ashamed, and they hid themselves. So the Old Testament is a picture where God has designed a system where mankind can, can be atoned for their sins by, by placing a lamb on an altar. Follow with me. We're answering the question, why did Jesus die? But, I'm, I, but I'm, I'm backdooring you by dealing with the guilt issue that every single one of us deal with, myself and every one of us. So in the Old Testament, it's about dealing with this guilt. How do we deal with it? Through a lamb, sacrificial lamb. The nation of Israel comes together. They sacrifice the lamb, and, 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 and the sin of Israel is atoned for. Not washed away, it's covered. And then one day, Jesus' cousin. Does anybody know the name of Jesus' cousin? John the what? Baptist. He sees Jesus walking down to the Jordan River, and John looks at Jesus. He's six months older, and he looks at him, and here's what he says. Here's what he says. He doesn't say, what's up, Jesus? He didn't say that at all. He says, behold the what? Everybody say, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the what? The sins of the world. See, sin is a transgression, right? It's a thought, word, or deed. And a sin triggers a feeling of guilt. And if it's not dealt with, it becomes an embedded shame. That, that foreboding sense of there's, there's just, there's that fundamental part of just about who I am that doesn't match up. We can deny it, we can repress it, or we can deal with it. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the what? Say it, the sin and the guilt and the shame of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Pastor, why did Jesus have to die? On a cross. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm, I've never really been a big fashion person. I appreciate it when I see somebody who dresses nice. And, and, and there's different things. And I've never been a chain person, but, but there's beautiful chains of people and necklaces and different things. And one of the things that people often will put on a necklace is a what? A cross. Now, I want you to think about this. I say this respectfully. 
do you think they really realize what it represents? Well, the cross, it represents Christianity. No, no, time out. Let's back up. The cross doesn't represent Christianity primarily. Primarily, the cross represents the crucifixion. The cross is a first century device that killed convicted criminals. I want you to think about this for a moment. The cross, people no more would wear a cross around their neck in the first century any more than we would, and I say this respectfully, walk around with an electric chair around our neck. The cross was a, was a, was a, what's a, it was a torture device. It was a sign of where, where there was deep suffering and pain and ultimate crucifixion. In other words, Jesus Christ died on a what? Everybody say it, a cross, but there was a reason why he died on the cross. He died as a convicted criminal, even though he was, even though he was innocent. In other words, he died in my, say it, place. He died and took the pain of my sin, the penalty of my sin, and paid the price of my sin. Why? Because sin produces guilt, which results in shame. In other words, when I confess who Christ is and I come to the cross, he's not forgiven. I'm forgiven for what I've done. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. The power of the cross. As a teenager, I, my parents prayed for me. Some of you have heard my story. I I remember when I was in that Bible study, I was a freshman at Tulane University, and, I, I, and one, of the, one of the two thoughts that I had in my mind, number one, is that I've sinned too much that God can't forgive me. I want to encourage everybody at all of our campuses, God's hand is so strong, you can't run from the hand of God, and God's hand is much bigger than your sin. Much bigger than your sin. You've never, there's not one person that's committed a sin that's too great that God's blood cannot forgive. Nothing, nothing. The second thing I thought was this. Here's the second thing I thought. Well, you know what? I'm going to just have to change and then present myself to God. I want to help everybody. You don't change and then present yourself to God. You present yourself to God with all your good, your bad, your ugly. He's the one that cleanses you. And Jesus then presents you clean to the Father. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. Hebrews 10 Verse 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the presence of Almighty God. How? By your own strength, by your merit, by comparing yourself with somebody else, by saying, well, I'm not a murderer. Well, I'm not. The no, 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 no. Time out. We all compare ourselves. Don't do that. Every one of us, the Bible says, are sinners in need of a Savior. We don't compare ourselves. Well, my sin's not as bad as theirs. No, some sin's just prettier than others, but it's all sin in the sight of God. And we're all in desperate need for what? For the blood of who? Say it, the blood of Jesus. Not the blood of bulls, not the blood of goats, not our, the blood of Christ. Why the cross? Why the cross? Because without the cross, there's no shedding of blood. And without the shedding of blood, we're still in our sin, our guilt, and our shame. Thank God. How many are grateful for the cross? I'll close with this. I'll close with this. Pastor, all right, all right. I got it. God created me to love me and to have a relationship with me. I got that part. And I've got it. I understand the cross, that Jesus died on the cross to forgive me. But why the resurrection? You know, I, um, I enjoy communicating with people. I enjoy arguing in a healthy fashion. I've learned that as I've grown in the fruits of the Spirit. But uh, I, I've always been somebody, I like arguments. I like discussions. I like going back. And there's a thing called disputation, dispute. So to disputation is when you, when you argue and you go back. And I, I enjoy that. I've always, even before I was a Christian, I, 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 you know, you do critical analysis. So I enjoy that. I never forget when I was at Tulane, I had a conversation with a group. I became a Christian and this group of friends, they thought I was crazy. I thought, Steve, you're just, you're just going too far. And I thought, well, I'm just, man, I've been, I gave my heart to Jesus and, and, and this is real. This is not a philosophy. It's not an ideology. It's not a behavior modification, human performance program. Like, like I've met Christ. And they said, all right, Steve, there's good teachings in all religions. Do you give it to us? I said, well, yeah. 
there's good teachings. I, I think there's good teachings. And, and all religions have something that probably can help you if it extracted out. Yes. Then what makes Christianity different? And I said, well, because the founder of Christianity not only taught good moral principles, but he died for his followers. To which one of them said, I know there's been great religious leaders that are not Christian that have died for their followers. What do you say about that, Steve? And I thought about it for a moment. I thought, well, you're right. There's been other religious followers that have died. There's been other or teachers. There's been other teachers that have taught great things that have helped and improved society. And I thought about this. I thought, there's only one, only one, and I said, by the way, what I'm about to tell you is the, it is the differentiating component between Christianity and every other world religion. Right here, right here, what I'm about to say. I give it to you that there's been great teachers in other faiths that have taught things that have helped humans. I'll give it to you that there is other religious teachers that have died for their followers. But there's only one religious teacher that died and rose from the dead. Only one. Only one. Only one. By the way, by the way, the Bible says five, Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he appeared to 500 people. 500 people. I love this scripture. Why the resurrection? Without the resurrection, don't miss this, and I'm closing. Why the res Without the resurrection, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, the resurrection. It's not a side issue. It's not, it's not what kind of on the fringe. It's central to Christianity. Here it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Bible says, if Christ is not, what, say it, risen, your faith is futile. King James, dead. If Christ is not risen, our faith is dead. It's futile, and we're still in our sins. Why the resurrection power? Because, because at the cross, our sins were forgiven, but we're not just forgiven sinners. At the resurrection, the Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and I as believers and quickens our mortal body. In other words, we've been given the same power of the Holy Spirit to give us the power to walk with God as Christ did who was raised from the dead. That's a supernatural faith. This is not a head deal. We serve a living Christ who's given us his spirit and quickens us to live a new life. We're not just forgiven, we're transformed. We're not just forgiven, we're changed. We're not just forgiven. We are supernaturally empowered to live the Christ life. How many are grateful that God's given you a power to live the Christian life? Matter of fact, I want everybody to stand. Man, I got one more service. I'm so excited. I almost lost my voice there at the end. Listen to me, listen to me. This is a supernatural life. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads at all of our campuses. I'm going to ask our campus pastors to come on the stages as well right now. And if you're able to, those that are joining us online or Facebook Live or the different jails, I'm just going to ask everybody to bow their heads right now on this resurrection weekend. I've got one more minute. If you're in this place today and say, Pastor, I'm not sure about my relationship with God. I'm not sure if I die today, I'm ready to stand before God. I want to pray for you. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you. This is not about joining our church. But this is about trusting a God that sent his son Jesus to die on, in your place, in my place, who was buried on the third day he rose again from the dead to defeat death, hell, and the grave for you. Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know if you die today that you're ready to stand before God? The Bible says, whoever calls upon that name, the name of Jesus shall be saved. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes, go say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. If that's you, the count of three. I want you just to lift your hand up high so I can see it. Pray for me, Pastor. I need Christ. If that's you, one, two, three. Quickly, hold your hand up high so I can see it. God bless you right there. God bless you right there. Anybody else? God bless you right there. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ladies, right here. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. I believe that God brought you here today. God loves you. And God's got a plan for your life, sir. God bless you and you. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God bless you guys up top. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God bless you, ma'am. Anybody else? God bless you. 
Let's pray. Church, let's pray with those that are trusting Christ. Come on, let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Now say this last thing. Say, Jesus, I take my life, and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. I want everybody to look at me. Give me 30 seconds. If you prayed and trusted Christ as a card behind your chair, I'm going to ask you to fill it out. You do one of two things. Up front, our prayer team's here. You can give it to them. Guest Central on the way out. We got some pastors. The next thing is this. Last thing is we're doing something we've done one time before. Next weekend, we've got a water baptism. If you've never been water baptized, whether you trusted Christ this weekend or maybe five years ago, you never been water baptized since a, a, as a believer, you would simply text water baptism to 25827 or just show up next week after every service. We're believing for hundreds and hundreds of people to be water baptized. Isn't that powerful? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for the grace of God upon your people on this resurrection weekend. I thank you that you not only forgave us of our sin, but you filled us with your spirit to give us power to live the Christian life. Bless your people as they go forth this day in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, come on, can we give the Lord a hand clap? Can we do that? God bless you guys.